Tom Griffiths, what's it like to be one half of a 17 year overnight startup success? It's a funny thing, 17 years. When we started, we had, um, we didn't think we'd be here 17 years later. And it's nice to be here and still relevant. I think it's been great, you know. We've got to perhaps um, make sure we continue to evolve to meet what the customers are wanting today. Um, but, you know, I've got two young daughters who are pretty harsh critics, so that keeps them on the toes. So, Let's let's talk about the product, right? Because you're Tom, and the juice is Emma and Tom's. Correct. Is that how you spell your name? No H. No. Well, Thomas is an H, but not with Tom. Right. So why did you go with Tom's without a H? Well, I'll tell you. A, it fits nicely in the frame. <laughs> yes. And and it, it and it wasn't chivalry to put Emma first. It's because Emma and Tom um, spells eat. Ah, there you go. We thought that would be handy to use, possibly one day in a marketing try program. Some. Uh, which we've never, we've never done that, but so, you know, eat healthy food. And this is the Kickstarter. This is Kickstarter. It's a probiotic and prebiotic, so it's alive. I love that. Um, so can anyone start a juice company tomorrow? Or is it a little bit more complicated than that? You know what? It's funny. You and I could go up, up to the fruit growing regions and, and pack off a pallet of orange juice tomorrow. The, the hard part is the, what they call the last mile. That's all quite easy. You can just pay for that, can't you? And we, yeah. get it, we can get it put on a truck and shipped to a cold storage place in Melbourne. That's all quite doable. You've got to then go out and put it in the shop. Yeah. And if you haven't got a brand, or it's a me too product, what are the chances of the shop wanting to actually stock it? Now, you might have to give it away, and then hopefully if it sells, they'll reorder, but you've got to go back the following week. Mm -hmm. So the devil's in the detail about doing the, the work in the route trade and launching the brand that way. And, we did that early on, and the idea was that we put it in the shop. Let's say it was the, um, the Armstrong Street food store just near here. And in those days, it was run by two blokes called Nick. And you'd go and buy your sandwich, and Nick would say, mate, mate, get one of these new Everton Tom's juices. They're fantastic. You buy it because he's recommended it to you. You've not been advertised at. You drink it. You like it. You feel you've discovered it yourself. You tell your friends. Yep. And that is how we think the brand, a brand is built. Yeah. And then, of course, on the strength of that relationship and those sales, you then try and step up to a larger volume audience through a, a, a grocery chain. Okay, so I feel like I'm really familiar with the brand, even though I don't consume it heavily. I feel like I've seen it in more cafes than not. So um, how, did you, how did you get that critical mass or that first big milestone achievement that really put distance between you and the rest of your competition? Because it feels like you guys have got a bit of a stranglehold here. We do. Um, once again, it's going to these sole traders and you go and you talk to them and they, they, you leave some stock behind. And you go back a week later and they haven't had a chance to talk to their husband, wife, business partner. So you go back another week later and they go, okay, we'll put some in or maybe you put in 12 bottles for free. And then you come back on the fourth week and those 12 bottles have been sold so they then trust you and they buy 12 more bottles. At that stage, the relationship started, it's taken a month yep. and four visits. And then you must return and do what you say you're gonna do, week in, week out, to maintain supply. Because if you're not in their fridge, I guarantee you somebody else will take, will take the, your place. Yeah. It's very competitive. Now, so, this, is, this is not sort of a, a, a monopoly. You've gotta earn your right to be in that bit of, bit of real estate being their fridge. Yeah, totally. So does Juice, or has Juice always had a good name? Is it inherently seen as a healthy product or is it seen now as a really sugary product? Or you know, how have you differentiated or made sure that it resolves itself when that consumer really wants something that's refreshing, healthy, it's everything in one? Exactly, I think there's been a, it's come a full circle. Um, juice got a bad rap, not so much super premium fruit juice which has got whole fruit, all the fiber of the fruit in it. I think the, the lower end got a bad rap. We've just seen sales grow and grow and grow. So people get that ours is nutritional. They get you don't bring a leader in one sitting. You know, it's portion controlled. Um, they, they get that it's, it's, it's part of a balanced diet. Mm -hmm. um, so we've never seen that issue. I think the uh, sort of the, the older, more um, heritage brands from afar have had a, had a hard time. And we've seen that actually without knowing names, even in their sort of factory closures and things. Yeah. Where we keep on growing our sales, so. So you started off as a juice, 
but you now do so much more. Talk to me about when you took the leap to get into snacks and other lines and how much that's kind of contributed to the value of this, this massive business now. We took the leap to start our own distribution because we were going through third party distributors who've got a phone book full of you know, products they want to try and sell. Uh, so you, you get lost amongst the frozen chips and the olive oil and whatever else. So we did our own van. So then you start putting your van driver's hat on rather than your juice brand hat. And you put the handbrake on and think, what more can I sell to this shop? I'm here. Yeah. So then we start doing um, you know, low calorie natural um, quenches. And then we started some carbonated fruit juices and lemon lime bitters. We started uh, the no added sugar flavored milk. We just launched a range of, um, of zero calorie uh, carbonated flavored waters. Mm. Um, we often do kombucha. And then of course snacks come in because you say, well they might, the consumer might not buy two bowls of juice, but they might buy a juice and a protein ball or a coffee and a protein ball. So we've illustrated the brand can be stretched across quite a number of categories. And we actually don't know many of the brands who have done a similar stretch, um, quite so diverse, but it's, it's, it's worked for us Controlling distribution helps. We've got sort of 35, 40 vans um, right down the eastern seaboard and in Perth. So that really helps because we, you know, we can go in and talk to the customer, which helps an awful, an awful lot. And then the, the success on that platform drives those products into grocery. Yeah. And online, mind you. Yeah. So I have to ask, mate, like how have you personally and how has the business navigated what we've all been stuck doing with this pandemic the last two years? How have you done it? We've... Worked pretty hard. Emma and my CFO, Prabhal, done a great job um, managing day-to-day issues. Because we've been in business for such, such, such a long time, suppliers know us. Mm-hmm. We've always done what we said we were going to do. So we, we, we re- rearranged a few terms um, and we've juggled it through. Um, hasn't been easy. It's been stressful. Um, we've even come out of this first quarter of this financial year with a positive EBIT, despite Melbourne City being full, in full lockdown, which is... A, a wow. great, a great credit to um, the the team, particularly in Victoria, and you know, all thanks to the federal government who have stepped in and you know, obviously helped on on wages because we did suffer a significant mm-hmm. fall in turnover um, both years. Um, so I think if we hadn't been around for as long, we would have found it harder. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when you it's funny you, you lose sales to to clients like Atlassian and Google, mm-hmm. and then you have massive sales to quarantine hotels. And in Melbourne, the police force before riots. <laughs> Handy. Absolutely. Yeah. So tell me, right, um, the entrepreneurial gene runs in your family pretty strong. You're telling me about your dad off camera and the family. But what made you want to start a juice company of all things back then? And did that fit with your background? Or was it an opportune thing that you just stumbled across? Sheer madness. Um, <laughs> I'd been skiing in North America. and I was drinking these green juices in the Gondi going up to the high alpine in, in the mornings. And that was like the penny drops. And I'd been working in London in, in branded drinks for Pernod Ricard, the French conglomerate. I'd done a London startup as a CFO. So I sort of had branded drinks and startup on my mind. I saw this product and knew it wasn't in Australia. So came back, put it to Emma and took a year to get it going. So I did not have a clue. I mean, I thought, a, I didn't know what a, what a reefer was mm-hmm. back in those days. A refrigerated container, I'm told. Um, <laughs> so I've just know, learned something new. You learn. <laughs> You learn, and I'm still learning. And I, because I really like it because it's just, you know, it's, I'm not a sit behind a desk pumping out models type of, of person. I did a lot of that in the UK. Um, I enjoy going out and building things. Yeah. Um, so you touched on something then which I think is really key. It appears over the last 15, 20 years, a lot of Australian entrepreneurs have had success traveling abroad, seeing stuff that isn't done here yet, and bringing it back and acting on being yeah. first. Has that changed for entrepreneurs now in Australia because we're in such a global world, everything's easy to discover that's abroad without having to go touch it to see it? Is it as easy to be first at something here in Australia or is it harder and more competitive? Look, I think it's only subject to the limits of, of your imagination. I mean, being in Bondi, I was seeing, you know, in the media, all the people who are buying the big houses now are people who didn't exist 20 years ago. They're all blockchain, Bitcoin, um, buy now, pay later. It's, that's, that's the whole market of people who are coming in with some, sort of, some newly acquired wealth and things. So, but that's not to say that you know, food and drinks are dead because, hey, you've got to eat two or three times a day and it's legal. So 
there's opportunities there too. And people, I mm-hmm. think, post COVID, are absolutely looking for more um, highly designed and uh, produced products that address particular needs, like you know, nootropics, um, just general health and well-being is being emphasised by COVID. So I think we are, we're riding quite a good COVID rebound, hopefully, because mm-hmm. we haven't done the Harvey Norman and made a lot of cash out of COVID. Mm-hmm. But I think we'll, we'll ride the wave out of it as people look to, um, to gear up their own health mm-hmm. and their diet. What would you say or what do you say to your daughters with regards to pursuing a career in entrepreneurship compared to other vocations? We had a, we, we, my daughters are only 12 and 13, we were talking about school in the car recently and about working hard and things. And my little one says, so we've got to have, get A's. I said, not, not at all, not at all. I just, I just want to see you try as hard as you can and then whatever you get is great with me. And she says, that sounds reasonable. And my view is to quote our, our mate recently, I just talked to you about Rex Gorell, there's a lid for every saucepan. So I think people find their way, mm-hmm. I really do. And um, yeah, your, your HSC or VCE score does not determine your entire future. Mm-hmm. You don't, I think it's, that's overrated these days, um, always has been. I think you know, having, a, having a go is the most important thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think being tenacious. That's yeah. one thing Emma and I definitely are, we are tenacious. Yeah. So when you look at all of the Australian export founders and entrepreneurs that are really hitting it out of the park, Nick Molnar, uh, Melanie Perkins, the guys from Atlassian, is there one maybe in that batch that stands out to you? Is there one that maybe is lesser known that's really impressed you recently? Or maybe it's a business or startup that you've really seen and you've just been blown away by what they're currently doing and where you yeah. can see it ending up. There's a couple. Um, I mentored a guy called Kittle years ago when he was just starting his business and I spent a lot of time with him. And he owns a business called Delishu. And it, it, it started off as vegan bacon flavoured seasoning. I like that. But he's ridden that whole, you know, plant-based wave beautifully. And he's killing it. He's doing, he's raised half of his money out of the States. He's doing huge sales online to the, to, I think I saw the paper last week, more than 70% now offshore. So, I mean, he's not well known, but Kittle, all credit to him. He's worked really hard. He had a, he had a go. And he's also, I wouldn't say pivoted, but moved with what he had mm-hmm. and turned in something that, is quite desirable. So he's now got backers like Russell Kogel and people like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's, he's cracked it. And yeah, it's hard to get up past that sort of, that sort of $5 million turnover mark. And you know, often at that level, you aren't making much money because there's no margin left. Once you pay your insurance premiums and your staff you need and everything else, um, gross margins consumed by your overheads. So he sort of seems to have got up past that sort of, that threshold level of making, yeah. some, making some good money. You know. Another person who was on our board years ago who had been very helpful to me was Carolyn Criswell. And, you know, she's just done a great job with Carmen. Just, you know, it, it, every year she, she steps up and does it better. And if we have a look at the supermarket range and what she's got, and the new products, the sachets and the granola and things, she's done a tremendous job. Hmm. Yeah, all by herself, up against Uncle Toby's catalogs and probably the supermarket's own brand. So it's pretty hard. So what's it like to be and feel innovative 17 years in and still have that startup feel and energy um, knowing that you've you know been at it for a while like how do you keep that that vigor and you know as, as a business as well because it's scaled now yeah it's, it's a bit like having a, having, a, having a child um, and we know that if we do a good product we can pump it out through 35 vans mm-hmm. and get it to 3,000 plus cafes in a couple of weeks mm-hmm. and obviously with all the NPD that we do, some things don't work as well as others. Well, there's not a huge cost to us there. We just basically sell out what, what, what we've got, perhaps burn some labels and move on. But we, mm-hmm. we're continually sort of, if you like, trying to chuck mud against a wall to see what sticks and what's going to work. So have you ventured into this growing niche space of vegan, plant-based? Well, we're all plant-based. Yeah, so you yeah, already, you're plant-based. already there. <laughs> um, the odd one or two things might contain honey. I think the odd probiotic might be a lactose-based bacteria, but on the whole, you know, we, we declare, uh, yeah. and, our, and our new range of waters is vegan. Um, so we've worked with plant-based. We were plant-based in 2004. Yeah. Two years. 
<laughs> so I have to ask you, right, given that you've operated on all different sides of business, right, you've been the chairman, you've been the CEO, you've been the investor, you've been the mentor, you've been the advisor, you've been the founder, what is the most important element if you had to single out one for a startup business to thrive in Australia? Knowing that it's going to be different in other countries like America and the UK and Europe, uh, Australia is a very different market, as you know. It's kind of first world, but it's small. Um, and a lot of things it's kind of discovered and, you know, we, we don't have the ability of launching something that's not perfect but still being able to get some really good results because it's a big amount of people. What's the most important thing for a startup to thrive here? Funding. Okay, Assuming yeah. you've got, you know, obviously your new idea has got to be either provide something which is new and, and wanted mm -hmm. or better. Yeah. There's no point going out and doing... So we're really good at making new and better stuff here? but funding it to become... Getting it funded, it's very hard to get enough funding at, at that early stage. Yep. You know, people are all happy to pile in when it's a great success. Yep. But um, it is, I know a lot of startups come to me and talk to me about this sort of thing. And you know, the funding question is difficult. So what or how and, and why would someone jump in earlier and participate as one of those first stage, first check investors? Like what's the benefit to entice more people in Australia to do that? Well, I'll tell you, a man of mine was offered shares in Afterpay, um, and he thinks it's cost him $200 million because he turned it down. Right. Now, the challenge there is, of course, he would have had to have had the same vision as the, as the founders had at the time and be able to see where this could go. And he didn't have the headspace to put any work into it and just passed on it. Mm -hmm. um, so you need to have the same level of vision um, that the founder does, which means doing the work, mm -hmm. I think. And, but have, if you do the work and you get it, and you align with the founder, of course you're getting in at a very, very early stage. It's mm. a very, very cheap valuation. Um, I think you've got to be able to look at that money and not want to see it again for five, for five or more years. Yep. So it's a certain type of investor who would be doing that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was talking to Rowan Workman last week who's working with Paul Little and they've got a, a very good fund and they're doing sort of up to a million dollars for startups. Mm -hmm. um, and those sort of people are, are now seeding a lot more success. Mm. Yeah, well, I mean, we'd all love to have been first in Afterpay. What was it about that early that maybe a lot of people didn't see? Or was it maybe a case of it was pretty impossible to see unless you were looking for it? You know, like what was it about it that we all missed? Everyone wants to know that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you need to have the same vision the founders did. Mm -hmm. You need to know how scalable it was. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's, it's called the TAM, of course. The yep. Total Addressable Market. And mm -hmm. it's, yeah, it's, it's valued on that. Mm -hmm. um, a la mm -hmm. F45. I mean, F45's metrics from memory were turnover 80 million, um, had to do a distress debt round only last year for a couple of hundred million just to keep it afloat. Um, uh, X percent, a large percent of, of, of the outlets of uh, uh, franchises aren't owned. Get to one, a $2 billion market, market cap. So that's a good news story, that one? They, they, they killed it, for what yep. they were, because yep. it's the, back to the whole total addressable market. So with so F45, the growth that can occur. If you're going to show the market what you can do from, from your base mm. and what, what, what can be, you can sell that. Yeah. There's a great line. I've just, I've just read a book um, by Michael Lewis, who, you know, Moneyball, et cetera, called The Premonition mm -hmm. about COVID in the States. And he talked about a guy who had made three $1 billion medical companies and he described what he did was by saying he found a, an absolute expert in their field and turned their knowledge into software <laughs> that's amazing so clever. i feel like we do a really good job of that in australia so but we don't do as good a job to commercialize it who was that guy michael lewis, lewis who wrote wow. lies poker and moneyball and so three the hits big, the so this guy he was writing about had done three one billion dollar medical startups yeah You've obviously got this roaring business, which is doing its thing and demands a lot of your attention. But um, what do you like to do still within that business space? Do you like to mentor real estate startups? Do you like to cut checks? Do you like to go and start other businesses? Um, or do you like to invest in Bitcoin? You know, what sort of takes your fancy and excites you in the business world outside of your own? It's interesting. Um, I did a thing last week and I was asked the same question. And I'm involved with two businesses. I'm a I'm a non-executive director of a, basically a, an independent investment bank in Sydney called Record Point. And that's quite the polar opposite of Emerald Toms. Emerald Toms is a very public brand. All the products are in shops. You know. 
where record point basically solves complex problems for large corporations and it's all confidential. Mm -hmm. So I work with the team at Ripple Point, um, not on transactions per se, um, I, but I help with the business and I help the founder, Michael Furman. So I enjoy that a lot. I'm involved there a fair bit and I sort of talk to the office there all the time. Um, so that's my sort of, that's my side geek, yeah. Ripple Point, which has been, it's good, it's good fun. Years ago in, in another whole world, I worked for um, Merrill Lynch in banking, so I sort of know, I know it without being as good as the guys who are the... Did Thank you have lunch with Warren Buffett, the Oracle of Omaha? That would be nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. have, a, have, have a hamburger with Warren. Um, he's done well. Um, <laughs> so, so that's good fun. So that's Sydney based. So I'm up there. Yeah. And of course, in Sydney, we have a warehouse in the Toms. Yeah. So I go to the warehouse and you know, check in with the guys and things, particularly during COVID, just to support them, make sure they're okay. I remember when I spoke to you last time on a podcast, okay. you, you won't remember this probably, but you will now, I tell you, you were telling me about a business that's making new pallets right. made out of like recyclable materials or something yeah it, uh, it's i'm uh, making pallets out of recycled milk, milk bottles so and so it, what why not the wood is that it takes well wood obviously there's a, there's, a, there's a global lumber shortage mm -hmm. um wooden pallets can't be used for export mm -hmm. so only a brand new one-way pallet can be used for export mm -hmm. so essentially there's three billion one-way pallets that are destroyed every year used once and destroyed which i gather is accounts for 40% of deforestation or 200 million trees a year. So this was to solve the problem of all of that. And of course, a plastic pallet can be sterilized, which you can then use and reuse for food and pharmaceuticals. It can be used in dark warehouses where wood expands and contracts. Um, can be repaired and at the end of life can be returned for a rebate and we can just melt it down again and use it again. So that's another thing that I'm involved with, yeah. That's a no-brainer. It's great. Often there's businesses like that that are complete no-brainers. That business needs some funding because it's, it's early stage, hasn't hit revenue yet, and we need to get a, we need to get actually a thousand pallets into a pool to prove it that it works. Yeah. Because it's gonna be, the whole C-suite will always love it because of the ESG ticket tick, but it's the guys in the warehouse who are gonna make it live or die. They've yep. gotta like the product to use with product to yep. move pallets around on and to back over it and to see that, you know, that it's better than wood. Yeah. And if we have a pool of a thousand pallets, we prove the concept, and then it's back to this TAM thing, and saying, well, you know, we know CHEP, I think they buy 55 million new pallets a year. Um, CHEP can't be used for export, because they're wood. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole pool there that's waiting to be attacked, and no one's really moved on pallets since um, the Second World War. So that's ripe for yeah. being disrupted. This sounds like a... Um a crowdfunding one, or is it a lot of money that should Crowdfunding, they tend to like, once again, a commercialised product. And these guys are still about to get to market. They've got to yeah. have enough money to get it over the line. Yeah. So anyone out there who wants to be so, involved there and who enjoys logistics, give me a call. Yeah, yeah. So tell me, right, when you look at a business or a founder or a startup, you know, what makes someone or something a hell yes for you going, you know what? I'd like to learn more to consider investing. Is it the idea? Is it the TAM? Is it the person? Is it this awesome team? Is it a little bit of it's, a it's everything. I mean, you've got to have the, you must have the team obviously in place to, to execute. You so, have to. But if there's a team that's got a few of those things, you know, an investor's probably going to have to act relatively quickly because there's going to be a lot of people sniffing around. So how do you then size up that opportunity quickly to be able to move? I think you, got, you, you must know the market. You don't have to, yeah. obviously have to understand the opportunity. So yeah. if you don't know the market, you step aside because you can't assist it mm. um, unless you start from scratch and do a lot of work. Um, so mm. it's, but it's all those things. Obviously, it's the concept, it's the funding, but it's the, it's the drive of the people. Mm -hmm. um, and I suppose track record. Yeah. So what's been one of your big ideas that's come out of COVID personally? Have you had one of those ideas where you've woken up at 2 a.m. in the middle of the night and morning and you've gone, oh, I've got a great idea that's going to solve this problem in the world? I can't tell you. Stay tuned. <laughs> so there's several, yeah? Is that like a we're weekly occurrence? Couple, we're working on a couple of really good things right now, which have came out of COVID. Yeah. You know, COVID's changed everything, as you know. COVID has changed everything. If you're a founder or an entrepreneur, do you recommend go down the incubator route? Or do you recommend going and getting some mentorship of someone who's done it already in shadow? Or do you recommend just hustle, bootstrap, make it work? Um, yeah. I'd say mentor. I mean, in, in the early days of Emma and Tom's, we didn't seek advice. 
Yep. Now, it wasn't through arrogance. We thought we knew what we were doing, and that's always wrong because you don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. And we were both separately with our partners having children, and that becomes, you know, we often joke having children and doing a startup is like running a marathon and being past the refrigerator to carry. <laughs> you know, it's just a pain. Um, while she loved the little dears to death, you know, it's busy. So you start, you, you get a bit blinkered, and I think, and you're in your own little bubble. And you can't help that, it's your bubble. But to have somebody come in at 30,000 feet in a chopper and look down and go, hang on, you know, we, like we've just appointed a chairman, as I told you, only this year, which is madness. It should be done 10 years ago. Yeah. Uh, independent. A chairman or a board? A or just, chairman. So a chairman really is just that one person. Yeah, one chair. So, but that's a, otherwise it's Aaron and Tom and if you don't agree, you don't move forward. Yep. And, and we always thought that was normal, but it shouldn't be. It should be actually, one should be able to override the other if the idea is commercially sound. Yeah. And good for the business and the entire shareholder base because at the end of the day, it's, it's cash. Yeah, I love that. What are you reading right now? I've just finished The Premonition by Michael Lewis. I'm still reading um, Sapiens, Yeah, I started last year. Um, and I've bought down a book I just started reading. It's, it's, it's like a, a, a thousand handy survival tips. It's quite, it's quite fun. Yeah. So I sort of like factual books. I read a great book by, once again, by um, Bill Bryson last year, a, a biography on, um, on Shakespeare. Wow. Because no one ever met him, of course. Yeah. There's no pictures of the guy. Um, so everything I know about, about Shakespeare has been pieced together from... So that, yeah. that was sort of pretty, uh, pretty interesting. So, yeah, I tend to focus on factual things. What are you listening to? The new Elton John lockdown sessions. Very nice. It's good. Favourite Elton John song? Um, Tiny Nasa. Very cool. Um, what are you watching on Netflix? Whatever my daughters tell me to. <laughs> Squid Game. Squid Game. Hey, I heard about it. <laughs> so. I so don't watch. Oh, you know what? They kill me, my daughters. I watch fishing shows. That, oh, very that nice. I fish TV and my daughters are like, you're killing me. <laughs> do you kiss your fish when you catch them before you let them go back? No, but I do eat raw squid. Really? Sashimi. Is this the nickname? Is this the nickname? <laughs> the Squid King? The squid Where King. does that come from? Um, some smart ass mates. Okay. Don't want to say any more on that. It's, it's, it's more based upon my success in, in catching a squid. We'll keep it at that. There's nothing dirty involved. <laughs> now, I want to ask you, mate, before we finish up, if you had to give me the worst piece of advice you've either ever been given or you've witnessed someone else be given and you've been brave enough to step in and correct it, I'd love to hear that. And then I want to hear you tell me your best piece of advice you've ever been given. I've got a good friend who I'm helping with her business and she was told that she must never talk to the supermarkets and let someone else do it all for her. I said, you're mad. This is back to business. You should be the one who's best friend to the buyer. Mm -hmm. It's your brand, it's your business. And this would apply in any situation. You know, getting close to your customer. Um, and she was once again strongly advised to use consultants and advisors and people p p pitch up to you know, the supermarkets for her. And I'm like, no, no, for God's sake, go and do it yourself. You're the brand, it's your, it's your baby. No mm -hmm. one does it better. Yeah. So I suppose that's the bit of advice. Yeah. Another brand I heard, which is hysterical, spent like $30,000 on a marketing campaign. It was a, a, a brand like Emron Thomas, a, a, a liquid, a juice product. And the, the strap line they came back with after $30,000 was 100% yum. Wow. Guys, are you kidding me? Well, <laughs> guaranteed <Sorry>. yumminess. <laughs> yum. Rip Best it. piece of advice you've ever been given. Take advice. Okay, nice. Got any for me right now? No, you're looking good. Oh, thanks, mate. I appreciate <laughs> it. Well, I appreciate you coming down, mate. And for everyone watching, this was literally our first Sydney guest possible out of lockdown. So, Thank Tom, you. thanks for coming down and making it happen. Good to be here. Thank you. Beautiful. Thanks.